All right, so I'm gonna be taking you guys through how we made this pre-workshop. Uh, I call it the danger zone pack. So I don't even know how we came up with this honestly, but it looks kind of sick. So just keep in mind that this video is not gonna be a complete beginner's step-by-step -step process. I'm assuming that you have a bit of existing Unreal Engine, Rhino, or 3D modeling knowledge. Um, in fact, I'm actually working on this huge project, which is gonna be a complete beginner's guide step-by-step -step from, from very beginning introduction to Unreal Engine all the way through the entire process of importing models, texturing, lighting, cameras, everything, so you can actually get to this point. Half of it will be on my YouTube, and then the other half, or the real advanced technical, like the source part, will be uh, on my paid course, actually. And I know, oh no, I'm selling a course, but honestly, once you go through this, I'm calling it the Unreal Engine Masterclass. Once you go through this masterclass, you will literally be able to just approach any client and you will have the actual skills to do these $5,000 commissions or even higher. So that's why half of it is gonna be on my website because some of this stuff, honestly, I just cannot give away for free. I've worked way too hard for too many years to learn these things. So in saying that, a good majority of it, the in terms of actually getting to know Unreal Engine and getting you started and modeling and designing and creating all of that will be free on my youtube so you'll see that coming up uh the complete beginner's introduction so in any case i'm assuming you're not a complete beginner for this one i'm just kind of taking you through the design thinking and kind of how i came up with uh, this specific scene and some of the details that come with it. I'm assuming you have a bit of knowledge within these programs already. This was the initial kind of blocking concept we came out with. This is just a just a proof of the idea to kind of, you know, get the person, the client or whoever, just kind of build up some excitement and show the vision of what you're thinking within creating these kind of scenes. So this is a very low textured, um, low poly concept. However, you kind of get the idea of the vision and you kind of see what we're thinking and then this is the final product in relation to that you see very much the same idea but we've just kind of visualized it now properly so i'm going to be taking you through the kind of design process that we come up with this and you know going from google sketchup models to rhino unreal engine datasmith texturing lighting cameras and exporting so the first thing i did for this project actually was again not the good i not a good idea again google sketchup 3D warehouse. That's where we're going to get our models from. I just refuse to pay for <laughs> models. Um, honestly, I end up facing the consequences for that because I found that doing this whole Google SketchUp thing kind of does have issues now. And when you want to get into real high quality and advanced modeling and the ultra realistic look, Google SketchUp 3D Warehouse is not gonna pull through in those cases, but my justification is that the whole pre-workshop look is this kind of a gamer arcade looking thing. So if you have a little bit of low poly counts and this kind of video game look, well, that's the look we're trying to go for. If we were trying to do ultra realistic renders, then I would probably purchase an actual 3D scanned like car model. Yeah, I don't know. 3D Warehouse is pretty cool though. So what I did, for this scene, I said, well, we've got the, uh, the car model. We're gonna need the plane. And Esther said we wanted a A10 Warthog. So we went to 3D Warehouse, we got both of those. I ended up downloading a lot of these and looking through them all. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. You kind of just gotta go through 3D Warehouse and then see what looks good, what doesn't. Remember, you wanna look for a high poly count, at least above 40,000. The ones that are below 40,000 are kind of low quality and will, won't look very good in your renders. So we went through and we got one of one of these and then the plane that the car was in was a Boeing C-17. Now all of these on Google SketchUp, they did not have detailed interiors. So I actually had to remake and remodel the entire interior of a Boeing C-17. So I'll take you through that progress uh, process that was all in Rhino. See. They have like a pretty low poly interior, but overall the quality is pretty decent, I'd say, for Google SketchUp. So I downloaded that. So once we opened Rhino, uh, this is the existing one I'll show you in a minute, but the one that we downloaded, I'll show you what it looks like when you import it straight into SketchUp. So here's our model that we downloaded from the 3D warehouse. And as you can see in Rhino, it actually looks pretty detailed and pretty good. Just ungroup that. Whoever modeled this did a pretty good job. We can remove the door sections. Here we can see inside. So if we rendered this as it is, it would look pretty low poly and pretty bad actually, because the interior is literally just this. 
but on the outside everything else looks pretty good uh, considering so now I'll show you the one that I've actually modeled so what I had to do was so I went onto Google and got a bunch of images of an actual Boeing C-17's interior now if you're a military guy or Air Force guy watching this uh, you're probably gonna look at it and be like man it looks nothing like it maybe resembles it slightly. Um, I wasn't going for complete accuracy as long as it kind of resembled a Boeing C-17 was good enough. So I essentially had this image and like this image open in another on my other screen and literally just spent the entire day in Rhino just either grabbing random assets or rebuilding assets entirely uh, modeling this entire Boeing interior. Now I know that the C-17 does not have like these cargo nettings or anything inside it but again, most people are gonna look at it and I'm assuming most people are not in the Air Force or are gonna know that much about it. Um, generally resembles it. When you model these kind of things, keep in mind that the only camera angles we would see would be from like this perspective or kind of back here. So you'll notice at the front of it is not very detailed. I didn't really bother modeling down that end because you wouldn't really see that within the final product. So I've kept this since university to set up your camera angles first before you even begin modeling anything so that you only detail within what's within the camera because otherwise you're going to waste so much time although i'll be honest the initial idea was to only do the interior but i ended up liking this model of the plane so much i decided well we're going to do some exterior shots so i ended up tidying up a bunch of uh, modeling issues in this in unreal engine which i'll show you once we get to unreal engine this was very difficult because the initial interior of this was very low poly it was not even really straight oh uh, sorry it's not even really an actual circle it's more straight sections which in a real plane this is a smooth radial line but in SketchUp, you know, it's a low poly model. So it's kind of turned into this um, jagged edge, low poly model. So I had to go through and recreate the entire interior. You'll see the interior is completely separate from the um, hull of the SketchUp model. I only kind of used it for these areas where you got the door. This kind of thing is a, bit, a little bit advanced, but if you know Rhino, you kind of know how to do this. Uh, some of these assets are just ran from random projects that I've downloaded and just kind of slap them on. This doesn't really make sense to have in an actual Boeing plane, but I've just chucked that on because it kind of makes, you know, adds to that aesthetic. Uh, these cables and lines, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do in Rhino because you can just use the curve tool here and you just click on a bunch of random points, like so. Press enter. And you've got a curve right here. You just use the pipe command. I don't know, we'll just go 10. You go enter, enter, enter again and it creates a pipe along your curve. And so now you've kind of got this cable. These, this looks very good. This has lots of applications for it. You know, you can do sci-fi projects or I know a lot of city streets and you have like power lines and cables going through. It's, you know, a good, good tool to use, the curve and pipe. And then I imported the cars and just put them on here to set it up. We got these kind of chains going into these hooks on the ground. Uh, a lot of it is just looking at the picture seeing the texture of something, seeing kind of what it looks like because you know you can compare this to the model I've got. It's definitely not exactly accurate or anything but it's uh, close enough. So yeah that's essentially what I've done in Rhino there. And then we just highlight everything, type in export and save it as a Datasmith file. And then now we're going to open up Unreal Engine and I'll show you some of the problems and issues we run into when using this workflow because honestly this whole Google SketchUp 3D model thing is starting not to work now and I'm starting to see why it's not the best pipeline to use but but I'm autistic and I still do it because it's free <laughs> so let's open up Unreal Engine and I'll show you how we did this this is the final product in Unreal Engine but we'll get to that in a minute I'm going to show you the workflow that I used of importing the uh, C17 so Go import materials and textures. So this is what it looked like when I first put it into Unreal Engine. Now, those of you who know, um, 
when you're using a Rhino to Unreal Engine a workflow, you have a big issue uh, with mesh geometry normals. Now, geometry normals are a nightmare because let's say this project took me 30 hours to make. I swear I spent at least 10 hours just fixing the geometry normals. Like, <laughs> you know, people think, wow, this must be so fun to make your designing all this and creating all this. Well, no. Most of the time I was literally just sitting here inverting the damn geometry normals because I don't know what's wrong with this pipeline. There's probably some reason for it, but essentially you see here, we've imported it into Unreal Engine and you can see through this certain part of the geometry. So you have to go into attributes, normals, and then go either fix inconsistent normals, which will work sometimes, or go invert normals, which you have to figure out which one uh, works best for each, for every single mesh that is broken. So we go invert and accept. Now you can see every single letter was an inverted normal. So we have to select each letter individually like this, it's giving me PTSD just doing it again. But, and then go either invert or fix. You see, going fix only fixes some, and then inverting fixes. It's absolutely messed up. Like. I mean, this is what I get for not paying for the model and just using Google SketchUp. But you can see throughout the entire model that there are a bunch of geometry normals that are inverted, broken. You get a whole bunch of gaps. See, I'm pretty sure the engine's not supposed to look like this. So I spent literally the whole day just going through and flipping each of the normals that were the wrong way around. So this is one of the biggest issues you'll get using the SketchUp to Rhino to Unreal Engine pipeline, or even straight up just from Rhino to Unreal Engine, you still get these uh, normal issues. I'm not too sure on the technical details as to why this is happening. Is it something that Epic Games can fix, or is it just because I'm using the wrong pipeline? I don't know. But yeah, that's a big thing to keep in mind with this. I should probably look into more detail on how to flesh that out better. But yes, that's what it looks like. This is literally what it looked like. The same file that I used when I made this. So I spent the entire day flipping the normals. I'm not going to sit there and do that and show you because honestly, this will turn into like a 10 hour video. I'm just going to go back to that final product that we had. So before I get into the details of the plane model, I set up the sky by deleting the sun sky and only using directional light and sky atmosphere. So this uh, directional light, this is it by itself. It's literally just lighting the planes and the interior. And then the sky atmosphere is the kind of atmospheric look. Um, I did have clouds on the actual render, uh, but the reason you know, these take a lot of setting up, um, you can adjust the heights of the clouds and whatnot. Uh, it works for still renders, but because I was rendering a movie for this, I decided it was easier just to delete the clouds and have the planes moving. Uh, and you wouldn't be able to tell that the ground isn't moving. It just saves a lot of extra movements when rendering movie scenes. So as for the interior, you can see it looks exactly the same as it did in Rhino, but I was gone ahead and textured it. I made some custom textures. I kind of looked at what an actual Boeing C-17 the, the, the actual metal looked like and try to replicate that within Unreal Engine. Again, I used the automotive materials pack. Uh, as I said, this is my favorite pack to use. And I just used um, metal. And I just copied the frosted one and just adjusted some of the parameters to make it either the material that I wanted. So you can add a tint to it to change the color and you can increase and decrease the roughness. I think that's essentially the only two things I changed to get that kind of painted Air Force metal kind of look. So this is what it looks like after I went and inverted all of the broken meshes and geometry normals. This was like the final result. And as for the interior, um, in these high altitude plane scenes, you'll need to really be careful with the lighting because if I was to delete or remove, say these, you can see that without any lighting on the interior, it becomes very underexposed due to this extremely high exposure of the directional light. So I made sure that these interior lights are really powerful to match almost the same intensity as that sunlight that we've got. Uh, or it depends on where your camera is and I set up different lighting conditions for each camera that we used. So I saved a whole bunch of different levels. 
uh, and lighting combinations for each camera because say a camera here like this is going to need different lighting than a camera that's over here. So I'll take you through some of the cameras, uh, the main camera that we used. She will change this to the cinematic viewport and go to one of the cameras. So this is the main camera and in Unreal Engine, I think this came in either 5 or 5.2 or something was uh, lens settings on the cameras. So you can enable this by going to, I think it's to so your plugins and you go lens. You need to activate all oh, camera calibration it is. You got to enable that, then restart. Then you're able to go here on the right and go to lens. Now this is how I got this kind of fisheye lens view. As you can see as we move around, we've got this pretty neat fisheye kind of look which is what I originally envisioned when I made that concept render. So this new feature is pretty neat. Uh, you can make those kind of fisheye angle videos. Essentially, you go into lens here, then we're able to adjust some of the lens and distortion parameters here under distortion state. So really just, you can increase or decrease the lens distortion, you don't want to go too much. You can go the other way so it's more like the opposite of a fisheye. It's making me feel sick. And essentially I just change these parameters down so you can get as much distortion on the corners of the lens as you can before it starts to break. And then that's how you get that kind of fisheye look. Uh, also, something really prevalent and new that I used in this project was the dust mask. I think this is perfect for a scene like this. You know, if you actually had a camera on an airplane like this, you'd get a lot of wind and dust going on the camera. It just kind of adds that fisheye look as well because you can see even the lens dust has this kind of fisheye to it. So we go back to the original, sorry, the actual camera parameters up here. And we go down to lens effects and you can go dirt mask and you just download uh, a general dirt mask overlay and you put this on so you can see without it the camera looks quite clean uh, nothing on, on the lens it all depends on what kind of look you're going for or what you want but I quite liked having this dirt mask you don't want to overdo it you know, if you're like 200 you know it gets a bit too obvious that it's sort of like Battlefield 3 or something here but I like to keep it down, it's kind of subtle so you can just notice it. Uh, texturing on this plane was the same thing. Again, it's a Google SketchUp model, none of this stuff you want to look at very closely because it's actually not very detailed or very good. I, mean, I was playing around with the interior and I thought the fisheye plus the dust mask looks pretty sick on the interior. It looks like an actual POV from a pilot. So I ended up using that in the final, pro uh, final product. But essentially that's how I made that. I set up the cameras, uh, same movie pipeline as the last video of the that I made on this. So I just set up the camera, put a keyframe in, uh, use the same configuration. This was a square video. So I, any any Instagram video I always render at 1920 by 1920 and then downscale it either in Premiere Pro or Photoshop depending if it's a photo or video then downscale it into like 1260 by 1260 because if you post an image on Instagram that's at 1920, you're relying on Instagram to downscale it and that's when you start to get those jagged edges, kind of weird kind of look. So I downscale it in an Adobe product, then post it. There's just a little tip there for you, I guess. Set the custom playback range just to frame one, end on frame two because you want a still image. Again, using those anti-aliasing settings I usually use subsample counts of between 10 to 20, usually 15. Again, it's, it's up to you to experiment with your own machine, your rendering times um, with the anti-aliasing, but you definitely want something over 10 to get a decent quality image. The render warm-up count was 32. So the, these parameters here are generally what I use. You can copy that. Same with the output. Uh, that's really all I set up. Most of it's already set up in Unreal Engine. And then I just hit render on the camera, and then that's how we get that final scene. 
So that was just a really brief kind of overview of how I made this and came up with this and the design thinking. Uh, so if you want that, that beginner's step-by-step -step guide throughout the entire process of Unreal Engine, make sure to look out for that in the future. I'll be coming out with that very soon here on YouTube. And then we've got that more deeper advanced course coming out on my website if you're interested in that. So that's how we make that pre-workshop danger zone pack. It's fairly straightforward and uh, thank you for watching.